Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to our Sunday service. Uh, I know we are unable to do this because of the pandemic, but I think as we slowly start to open things back up, maybe we can quickly do this. For those who are actually in service during, I guess, in our chapel, can we just quickly turn to our neighbors and just maybe nod and say hello? How are you? Um, we can't shake their hands or give them an elbow bump, but maybe we can actually greet. Because I feel like some of you guys, I see you guys on Sundays, but I don't even get to say hi because right after Sundays, you guys are gone. And we can't really fellowship, but, you know, uh, I think many of us really miss uh, our spiritual community, uh, doing life together. What does that look like in a new normal? Uh, I guess fo while following the guidelines, if you guys can uh, pray for us, that we will learn how to adapt without neglecting our, our community. Uh, so I uh, really wanted us to do that this morning as we begin. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, let's turn to John chapter 7 as we depend uh, on the Lord and his word together this morning. John chapter 7, uh, we'll be reading uh, verses 10 through 24. John chapter 7, verse 10 through 24. And if you found it, let's all stand as we read God's word together this morning. John chapter 7, verses 10 through 24. Verse 10, but after his brothers, Jesus' brothers, had gone up to the feast, then Jesus also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there's so much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he is a good man. Others said, no, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but he, his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, then he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marveled at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearance, but judge with right judgment. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. You guys may be seated. Joel, pray with me one more time. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the living word, the truth. This morning, we ask and pray that as we sit under the authority of your word, grant us humble hearts, hearts that are open and willing to receive not only the words that we want to listen to, but receive the truth of your whole word. So be with us, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you guys are taking notes, the title of today's message is called Seeing with Clarity. Seeing with Clarity. And as we begin our time together this morning, I want to quickly ask you guys, how many of you guys have ever worn or are currently wearing or have, yeah, have worn in the past or are clear, uh, currently wearing glasses or contacts of some sort? Some of you, how many of you guys have perfect 2020 vision? Bless you. Bless you. That is a great, great blessing. I, I started wearing glasses when I was in second grade. Uh, second grade of elementary school, and at, th at that time, my eyesight got so bad uh, and I, that I couldn't even find my glasses when I, was, when I woke up in the morning. Um, oftentimes, I would share that my eyes got so bad because I was reading so much, but it was uh, because I was playing too many video games or watching TV too close. Um, friends, just as many struggle with physical eyesight, I believe many, both in and outside the church, struggle with spiritual eyesight. Uh, due to sin, temptations, distractions, uh, the, the enemy's attack, the list can go on and on. And if we're not actively doing something about our spiritual eyesight, our spiritual vision, things will become more blurry and skewed to the point where we 
uh, might not be able to see clearly. We think we might be seeing life very clearly, seeing Jesus, ourselves, people around us very clearly, when in reality, we might not be able to see the way God desires for us to see. So through, through today's passage this morning, God is not only warning us of the dangers of spiritual vision loss, but also teaching us how we can see clearly in our lives. So let's dive into today's passage. Before we do that, let me just quickly set the stage for us. Uh, previously, during our time together two weeks ago, we looked at the beginning portion of chapter 7, which introduced the Feast of Booths. Uh, the Feast of Booth was at hand, and Feast of Booth was one of the three major Jewish annual festivals where people were flocking to Jerusalem, were pilgrimaging to Jerusalem to celebrate this grand festival. And millions and millions of people would gather together for this festival. And knowing this, Jesus' brothers, he had brothers, uh, very own brothers began to entice him or even tempt him to say, uh, this is your opportunity to make it big. This is your opportunity to make a name for yourself. Instead of just hanging around in little old in Galilee, kind of like Connecticut, to go down to the big stage of New York, the Big Apple, or to the big stage in Jerusalem and show what you can do, referring to his miracles, just like he had done in Galilee. Jesus, however, refuses and turns down their offer for two reasons. Number one, because Jesus was well aware that although they were his very own brothers, blood-related brothers, we see in verse 5 of chapter 10 that they did not believe in Jesus as anything more than just their brother. They did not believe that Jesus was divine. They did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah or the Son of God. They just thought he is just another older brother of them. The second reason why Jesus didn't go down was because his time has not yet come. Verse 6, it says, Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. Although Jesus' brothers was going down to Jerusalem, and it meant for them a great opportunity to seize the moment, a shortcut to success, highway to Hollywood. If Jesus just snaps his finger and per perhaps even turns water into wine again, or turns stone into bread, or feeds a multitude with two, five loaves and two fish, then they're going to live a life of fame. However, for Jesus, going, to, going down to Jerusalem, it meant the cross. It meant his, to face his imminent death, to come face to face with what God had in store for him, to become the ultimate sacrificial lamb. As we see in chapter 7, verse 1, people, the Jews, were seeking to kill Jesus. He knew it was going to be a hostile situation going down to Jerusalem. However, what's really interesting in today's passage is that uh, despite telling his brothers that he's not going down there, despite telling his brothers that he's going to remain in Galilee, we see in verse 10 that Jesus goes to Jerusalem. So what's going on here? Did Jesus all of a sudden have a change of plans? Was Jesus just going back and forth with his decision and couldn't really quite make up his mind? Because he, didn't he just tell his brothers that he wasn't going? So then why did he all of a sudden say he's going to go now? I believe the reason for Jesus' behavior can be found at the end of verse 10. Verse 10. At the end of verse 10, it says he's going down there, not in public, but in private. We see that the reason behind why Jesus chose to go down alone to Jerusalem later on, not with his brothers, was because he wanted to go in private, in secret, rather than to go with his brothers to cause a big scene. Jesus was already a wanted man down in Jerusalem as people were muttering about him and looking for him, ways to, uh, looking for him during the Feast of Booth. If you look at verse 12, although some thought Jesus to be a good man for the fear of the Jews because they don't want to be associated with Jesus if he was a wanted criminal, no one spoke openly about him because the general consensus was that the Jews, at least the leaders of the Jews, wanted Jesus gone. You see, although Jesus' brothers wanted him to use this as an opportunity to show himself to, in Jerusalem, Jesus knew that that wasn't God's way. That's not what God wanted Jesus to do. Jesus could care less about the praise of men, and he was not interested in robbing God of his glory that he deserves by causing a scene down in Jerusalem. Instead, Jesus wanted only to do what is pleasing to God, and what would ultimately bring him glory. 
This is why Jesus decides to go down on his own, not with his brothers, not in public, but in private during the middle of the feast. You see, the Feast of Booth was a week-long celebration. So instead of going in the beginning with his brothers, Jesus decides to go in the middle of the feast. And what makes it even more interesting is as soon as Jesus goes down or goes up to Jerusalem, he goes straight to the temple and begins to teach. Now, this was flat out weird, strange, and unusual to the Jewish crowd in Jerusalem during that time because, you see, from their point of view, Jesus had no business being there. Jesus had no business teaching in the temple. I can just imagine some of them saying out loud, who do you think you are? You don't belong here. Friends, imagine with me. From a Jewish perspective, you are gathered in the temple during a special time, such as the Feast of Booth, to listen to some profound words and teaching led by some well-trained, well-respected rabbis or Jewish teachers who has gone through some very thorough training in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. Yet here comes this guy, this nobody, out of nowhere without notice, without prior arrangement, and he begins to teach. He begins to teach things that you've never heard before. Despite how profound his words might be, you would be a bit suspicious a bit confused because at least in, the, in their prior knowledge, the Jewish temple was not holding an open mic session. They were not having an open mic night for anyone to come up and speak and teach in the temple. This is why the Jews responded in verse 15. How is it that this man who comes out of nowhere and he begins to teach when he has never learned, when he has never had a proper rabbinic education? Who, who was your teacher? Who did you train under? Where did you receive your education? And are you even licensed to preach or teach? Friends, although we're not told in specific what the content of Jesus' teaching was, what Jesus taught or how Jesus taught was for sure offensive to the Jews. In the Jewish temple, the rabbis would often teach from the law, referring to the Old Testament, or the Mosaic Law, or the Hebrew Bible, as well as extra-biblical teachings, extra-biblical texts focusing on oral laws. These laws that they made up on top of the Old Testament law to make themselves a lot more holier or strict. However, the focus of Jesus' teaching, the content of Jesus' teaching, was centered around the kingdom of God rather than the law itself. Not only that, oftentimes when the Jewish teachers or the rabbis would teach, they would also reference or refer to other rabbis, referring to even prophets like Ezekiel or Moses. But when Jesus was teaching, he was initially not quoting any rabbis, but he shares rather that his authority is from God himself, that he is a messenger sent from God, and he is now teaching with the authority of God the Father himself. Jesus didn't have any rabbinic tra training, yet he speaks and teaches as if he has greater authority and, than any of the rabbis, even the veterans as well. Friends, let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you uh, had to go to the hospital? If you had to go to the hospital for an appointment and all of a sudden this dude, this random nobody comes out of nowhere who did not even attend medical, medical school. He majored in philosophy Right? But he comes out, and he doesn't even go to medical school. He has zero experience as a doctor, and he tries to diagnose your situation. How would you feel? Get away from me, right? Or, or how would you feel if you were, go, if you were to go to a five-star fancy restaurant that has great reviews, yet you, someone who has never even held a knife before comes up to you and says, I will be your chef for the night? No thank you, right? That's exactly what's happening from the Jewish point of view. Jesus, I think you got the wrong place because Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, the temple of Jerusalem, especially during a big feast like the, fe uh, the tent of uh, Feast of Booths, it is reserved. This pulpit is reserved only for the top rabbis, those who have five-star reviews on Yelp, those who have much teaching experience on their resume. You? Where'd you go to school? As people began to connect the dots, they realized this random person is indeed Jesus. 
The same guy who caused the ruckus back in chapter 5 by healing an invalid man during the Sabbath. Not only that, he was blaspheming how he, was been, he, how he calls God the Father. They were not a fan of his word, and they were not a fan of his work. They were bothered and perhaps even angry as Jesus had ruined their Feast of Booth temple experience. However, although many thought that Jesus had come into the temple that day to ruin their party, from Jesus' perspective, he has indeed come, knowing that it will cost him his life, knowing that his life was on the line to remind them yet again, to remind the unbelieving Jews yet again just how blind they are to the reality of life, just how blind they were from seeing the truth. At a glance, from a Jewish perspective, what Jesus was teaching had nothing to do with them. And that he was being blasphemous by even putting his name in the same sentence as God, the divine God himself, just like he did back in chapter 5. But if they heard correctly, if they were willing to listen carefully to anything that Jesus had to say, they would lay aside, if they were to lay aside their pride just for a minute, then Jesus' teaching would have and should have reminded them of the promised coming Messiah from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 to 19. Uh, this is, it says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. This is one of the most important of all biblical promises for the Jews. And if we recall what Jesus has been sharing before, not only was the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, testifying that Jesus is indeed the promised Messiah, we see John the Baptist earlier on testifying that he is the one, he is the coming Messiah. And not only that, we see God himself during Jesus' baptism testifying that he is my son who I am well pleased. And Jesus, his very work, being able to perform miracles that people have never seen before, testifies that he is indeed the Messiah. All arrows are pointing to Jesus being the promised Messiah, yet they could not accept the truth because they could not see the truth. Friends, the issue with these Jews were never that Jesus wasn't convincing or that there was not enough evidences to see Jesus as the Messiah. But I believe rather it was a heart issue. They could have all the proof, they could have all the evidences laid out before their eyes, and when push comes to shove, they refuse to see and they refuse to accept Jesus as Lord. Why? Because they were too blind to see the truth. The answer to eternal life, something that they've been looking for all their life, has been de that they've been desperately searching for is right before their eyes. Jesus is standing right before their eyes that they are unable to see because they become too blind due to their pride, due to their self-righteousness, due to their self-centeredness. Perhaps this is how they viewed their religious life. From the surface level, they were being very faithful to do the will of God as they lived with God, within God's covenant promises by obeying His law. They were really big on obeying His law, keeping the Sabbath. Yet in the process of doing so, they made religious life about themselves and about them accomplishing or being faithful to the law and could care less about whose law they were following. They were priding themselves as law keepers and judging others who struggle to keep the law. And one of them was regarding keeping the Sabbath. As, and this is the issue that Jesus brings up again, and he uses this as an avenue to warn them and to teach them just how flawed their view of keeping God's law was. If you recall back in chapter 5, an issue arose because Jesus healed an invalid man, a man who was unable to walk for the past 38 years. Jesus healed, had compassion and healed this man, yet it happened to be during the Sabbath. And when the law of Sabbath is what? Keep the Sabbath, meaning do not do any work. 
Because of this, the Jews called Jesus out saying, he has broken the law by doing work during the Sabbath. This is why Jesus brings up this issue again regarding circumcision in verse 22. Let me explain. According to Genesis chapter 17, a Jewish boy is to be circumcised on the eighth day as a sign of the covenant before God and man. This is God's law of circumcision. They have to keep if you're a Jew. Verse 11, it says, He shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between you and me. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generation, whether born in your house or brought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. But friends, what happens if you're born on the Sabbath? For Jews, the day of your birth is considered day one. So let's say you are born on Sabbath, day one. Seven days later on day eight, what is it? It's the Sabbath. And that's when you're supposed to circumcise your son. So what happens? You're supposed to keep the Sabbath and not do any work, but also the law of circumcision says you have to circumcise your kid on the eighth day. So what do you do? Because there's no way to keep both laws. Well, according to Scripture... Since the work of circumcision brings salvation as it brings the boy into the covenant people of God, it is justified by Scripture. It supersedes the law of Sabbath. And it is with this argument that Jesus explains why he healed that invalid man in chapter 5. If the Jews are regularly breaking the Sabbath to heal one part of a man by circumcising the boy, then why can't Jesus break the Sabbath by healing the whole man? If through the healing, the man is now reconciled, forgiven, and made new in his, creation, in his relation to God, isn't that the work that brings Salvation? Doesn't that supersede the law of Sabbath? So why is circumcision okay, but healing not? To make matters worse, the Jews were so fixated on calling Jesus out for breaking the fourth commandment. And while doing that, if you recall, over and over and over again, what did the Jews want to do with Jesus? They wanted to kill him. Well, isn't that weird? Breaking the fourth commandment is not okay, but them struggling with keeping the sixth commandment of thou shalt not kill, that is okay because they kept wanting to kill Jesus. It's not okay that Jesus was breaking the law of Sabbath, but it's okay for them to plot to kill Jesus? That's not what the scripture says, so where did they get that idea? As I mentioned earlier, it was their pride, their self righteousness and self-centeredness that was blinding them from seeing the reality. They are really good at picking out the flaws of others, yet they were unable to see the plank stuck in their own eye. You see, friends, when push comes to shove, they could care less if Jesus was right or wrong, according to the law. What they really cared about was self-glory. Self-love. They took great pride in being faithful and religious to the law. Yet Jesus reminds them that how they were not being faithful to the law, how they were rather using the law, using religion for selfish gains. And that ticked them off. That's why they wanted to get rid of Jesus. They were using the Bible to justify how good they are, when in reality, the Bible should have reminded them just how wicked and sinful they are. How about us? Oftentimes when we read the Bible, what are some of our favorite Bible verses? Oftentimes it's what makes us feel good. It confirms us how good we are or how faithful we have been in life. When in reality, the, the truth of Scripture should remind us just how much of a hell-deserving sinner we are in need of God's grace. They are using the Bible to justify how good they are in comparison to others while judging others, when in reality they should have looked at the Scripture and been reminded how wicked, how sinful they are. Because if they had been listen, care, listening carefully to what Jesus was sharing, they would have heard and realized who Jesus was. That He was the promised Messiah. That their will was not aligning to God's will. That how they abused their position of leadership as well as scripture. And that was not pleasing to God. 
And that ultimately their pride, how their pride and self-centeredness was blinding them from seeing the truth. Rather than trying to humbly learn from Jesus, all they were interested in was trying to get rid of Jesus. Because he was getting in their way. Because he was reminding them just how skewed their view of God's word was. Because he was reminding them how they were living for their own glory and their own will rather than the glory of God and the will of God. So what does this mean for us? How can we apply this message to our lives? Friends, I believe the issue is not only for the Jews back then, but it exists even in our own lives today. Friends, there's a great danger there's a very great danger to appear, to seem like we're living a very religious life, thinking that we're fine. I come to church on Sundays. I have a Bible. I memorized a few Bible verses. I served a church. When in reality, our lives are very, very displeasing to the Lord. More often than not, we might try to bargain with God without even knowing we're bargaining with God by being extra religious hoping he'll overlook our sins and our addictions. Oh, I'll come to church today so that 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 will counter all the sin and addiction that I'm struggling with right now. We try to cover up our sin and our mistakes by doing more religious things. When in reality, God is asking us to just simply admit, to confess, to repent, so that we can finally see the truth. Friends, sin has a way of blinding us from seeing the truth. It distorts everything. Kind of like those distortion mirrors. If you guys ever gone to like a carnival or amusement park, you have like those distortion mirrors when you like stand in front. It makes you a lot taller than you really are or makes you a lot wider than you really are. I believe sin has that same effect. Sin does that to us as it distorts the way we see ourselves. We're not that bad. When in reality, we are very, very wicked and in need of God's grace. Oh, the, the way we see God, oh, he's not that mad at us. He's not that angry because at least we're doing things to counter our sin. No, he hates and he can't stand the sight of sin. The way we see others, oh, they're not that sad. Oh, I don't really need to love them. They're fine. No, friends, God desires for us to love our neighbors and even our enemies, especially during the pandemic. Friends, sin makes everything about ourselves, where we are the center. And if we're not careful, we read scripture with ourselves at the center. That's why our favorite verses has to do, if the Bible, two, sorry, 2,000 pages, over 2,000 pages, if you are the, if, if it had your name in it, if you are the center of scripture, you would, you would complain saying it's not long enough. If we, 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 we uh, pray, if we place ourselves at the center, we pray and we treat God as a genie. We treat God asking him to do things for us or else, when in reality, prayer is what? Submitting, prostrating yourself before God and admitting that you are desperately in need of him. You are wanting for him to take over. And we follow God with ourselves at the center, treating him not as our Lord, but as our servant. We will follow you only if there's conditions. Sure, I'll become your disciple. Sure, I will be a Christian only if. So then how do we overcome the spiritual blindness? How can we know God's will for our lives? How do we know if we are following God or not? How do we know if we are living a Christ-centered life versus a Self-centered life. I believe we need to ask God to humble us. Humility. To give us teachable hearts. Hearts that are willing to learn. Hearts that are willing to admit our wrongs, shortcomings, and willing to submit to the authority of God's holy and living word. To take God's word as the final authority rather than a suggestion. Friends, if there's never been a time, if there's never been a time where you have felt offended or uncomfortable when reading the scripture or when hearing a sermon, then maybe you need to pray and ask God to break your hardened hearts. 
If the Bible doesn't offend you, if the word of God doesn't affect and doesn't make you uncomfortable when you're living a life of sin, then you need to ask God to completely soften your heart so the word of God, God can penetrate into your heart. For him to reveal the truth, the reality, just like the Jews, it's, it's so easy for us to become blinded by our pride and our self-centeredness. And more often than not, we are a whole lot more interested in allowing God's plan to, plan to our plan rather than submitting to his. We don't want to surrender our plans, our desires, our will, because we actually think in our finite minds, we actually think our plan is better than his. Friends, can we come before the Lord this morning and ask God to humble us? What does that even mean nowadays, right? Humility does not mean, oh, I feel I, 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 I'm going to be weak. No, that's not what humility is. Humility is being strong enough to admit that you're desperate for Jesus. That you're not the king of your own life. Humility means learning to get off that throne of your life because you know that doesn't belong to you. If we're not actively asking God to humble us, it'll be difficult for us to see clearly. Let's ask God to unveil our eyes so that we can see the way he sees, seeing the scripture with clarity, seeing Jesus with clarity, seeing our lives with clarity, seeing others with clarity. If we're not actively cleansing out our hearts, the way we see everything in life is going to be skewed. Just as we take showers every day, hopefully, maybe every other day, hopefully not once a week, I believe we also need daily spiritual cleansing through prayer, through meditation of God's word. Friends, let's ask God to humble us and give us clear eyes to see everything through the lens of scripture rather than picking and choosing only what we want to see. Why are we not growing spiritually? Why are we not growing in our love for God? Maybe because we're not seeing clearly. Maybe because we're not wanting to receive God's word as the final authority of our lives. I pray that we will really make lives about our lives about abiding to his will and not ours, his plan and not our own, to live for his glory and not our own. Friends, let's do some spiritual cleansing of our hearts this morning as we reflect upon today's message. Let's pray together. As we come before the Lord, if you don't remember anything in today's passage, let's just ask God, God, humble me. Humble me to be able to receive your word as the word of truth, as the word of life. Lord, I ask that you will humble my life, humble my heart, whatever it takes, so that I may not lose sight of you. Let's pray for about a minute or so uh, before we respond with uh, our song together. Let's pray.